Shivaji Bansal Marathi Ia IBOS La C 1627–1630–3 April 1680 was an Indian warrior king and a member of the Bansal Maratha clan. Shivaji carved out an enclave from the declining Adilshahi Sultanate of Bijapur that formed the genesis of the Maratha Empire. In 1674, he was formally crowned as the Chhatrapati monarch of his realm at Raigad. Over the course of his life, Shivaji engaged in both alliances and hostilities with the Mughal Empire, Sultanate of Golconda, and Sultanate of Bijapur, as well as the English, Portuguese, and French colonial powers. Shivaji's military forces expanded the Maratha sphere of influence, capturing and building forts, and forming a Maratha navy. Shivaji established a competent and progressive civil rule with well-structured administrative organizations. He revived ancient Hindu political traditions and court conventions and promoted the usage of Marathi and Sanskrit, rather than Persian, in court and administration. Shivaji's legacy was to vary by observer and time but he began to take on increased importance with the emergence of the Indian independence movement, as many elevated him as a proto-nationalist and hero of the Hindus. Particularly in Maharashtra, debates over his history and role have engendered great passion and sometimes even violence as disparate groups have sought to characterize him and his legacy. <laughs> Early life Shivaji was born in the hill fort of Shivneri, near the city of Janur in what is now Pune district. Scholars disagree on his date of birth. The government of Maharashtra lists 19 February as a holiday commemorating Shivaji's birth Shivaji, Janti. Shivaji was named after a local deity, the goddess Shivai. Shivaji's father Shahaji Bansal was a Maratha general who served the Deccan Sultanates. His mother was Jijabai, the daughter of Lakuji Jadavrao of Sindhikt, a Mughal-aligned Sardar claiming descent from a Yadav royal family of Devagiri. At the time of Shivaji's birth, power in Deccan was shared by three Islamic sultanates, Bijapur, Ahmednagar, and Golconda. Shahaji often changed his loyalty between the Nizamshahi of Ahmadnagar, the Adilsha of Bijapur and the Mughals, but always kept his jagger fiefdom at Pune and his small army with him. Upbringing Shivaji was devoted to his mother Jijabai, who was deeply religious. His studies of the Hindu epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, also influenced his lifelong defense of Hindu values. Shivaji was deeply interested in religious teachings, and regularly sought the company of Hindu and Sufi saints. Shahaji, meanwhile had married a second wife, Tukha Bai from the Mohite family. Having made peace with the Mughals, ceding them six forts, he went to serve the Sultanate of Bijapur. He moved Shivaji and Jijabai from Shivneri to Pune and left them in the care of his Jagar administrator, Dadoji Khandio. Dadoji has been credited with overseeing the education and training of young Shivaji. Many of Shivaji's comrades, and later a number of his soldiers, came from the Maval region, including Yesaji Kank, Suryaji Kakade, Baji Pasalkar, Baji Prabhu Deshpand, and Tanaji Malasare. Shivaji travelled the hills and forests of the Sayadri range with his Maval friends, gaining skills and familiarity with the land that would prove useful in his military career. Shivaji's independent spirit and his association with the Maval youths did not sit well with Dadoji, who complained to Shahaji to no avail. In 1639, Shahaji was stationed at Bangalore, which was conquered from the Vijayanagara Nayaks, and asked to hold and settle the area. Shivaji was taken to Bangalore where he, his elder brother Sambhaji and his half-brother Ekoji I were further formally trained. He married Saibai from the prominent Nimbalkar family in 1640. Around 1645, the teenage Shivaji first expressed his concept for Hindavi Swarajya Indian self-rule, in a letter. <laughs> Conflict with Bijapur In 1645, the 15-year-old Shivaji bribed or persuaded Anayat Khan, the Bijapuri commander of the Torna fort, to hand over possession of the fort to him. The Maratha Farangoji Narsala, who held the Shakan fort, professed his loyalty to Shivaji, and the fort of Khandana was acquired by bribing the Bijapuri governor. 
On 25 July 1648, Shahaji was imprisoned by Baji Gorpade under the orders of Bijapuri ruler Muhammad Adilsha, in a bid to contain Shivaji. According to Sarkar, Shahaji was released in 1649 after the capture of Jinji secured Adil Shahi position in Karnataka. During these developments, from 1649 to 1655 Shivaji paused in his conquests and quietly consolidated his gains. After his release, Shahaji retired from public life, and died around 1664–1665 in a hunting accident. Following his father's release, Shivaji resumed raiding, and in 1656, under controversial circumstances, killed Chandrarao Moore, a fellow Maratha feudatory of Bijapur, and seized from him the valley of Jivali. Combat with Afzal Khan Adilsha was displeased at his losses to Shivaji's forces, which his vassal Shahaji disavowed. Having ended his conflict with the Mughals and having a greater ability to respond, in 1657 Adilsha sent Afzal Khan, a veteran general, to arrest Shivaji. Before engaging him, the Bijapuri forces desecrated the Tulia Bhavani temple, holy to Shivaji's family, and the Vithoba temple at Pandharpur, a major pilgrimage site for the Hindus. Pursued by Bijapuri forces, Shivaji retreated to Pratapgad fort, where many of his colleagues pressed him to surrender. The two forces found themselves at a stalemate, with Shivaji unable to break the siege, while Afzal Khan, having a powerful cavalry but lacking siege equipment, was unable to take the fort. After two months, Afzal Khan sent an envoy to Shivaji suggesting the two leaders meet in private outside the fort to parley. The two met in a hut at the foothills of Pratapgad Fort on 10 November 1659. The arrangements had dictated that each come armed only with a sword, and attended by one follower. Shivaji, either suspecting Afzal Khan would arrest or attack him, or secretly planning to attack himself, wore armor beneath his clothes, concealed a bog knock metal, tiger claw on his left arm, and had a dagger in his right hand. Accounts vary on whether Shivaji or Afzal Khan struck the first blow. Maratha chronicles accuse Afzal Khan of treachery, while Persian language records attribute the treachery to Shivaji. In the fight, Afzal Khan's dagger was stopped by Shivaji's armor, and Shivaji's weapons inflicted mortal wounds on the general. Shivaji then fired a cannon to signal his hidden troops to attack the Bijapuri army. In the ensuing Battle of Pratapgar fought on 10 November 1659, Shivaji's forces decisively defeated the Bijapur Sultanate's forces. More than 3,000 soldiers of the Bijapur army were killed and one Sardar of high rank, two sons of Afzal Khan and two Maratha chiefs were taken prisoner. After the victory, a grand review was held by Shivaji below Pratapgar. The captured enemy, both officers and men, were set free and sent back to their homes with money, food and other gifts. Marathas were rewarded accordingly. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Siege of Panhala. Having defeated the Bijapuri forces sent against him, Shivaji's army marched towards the Konkan and Kolhapur, seizing Panhala fort and defeating Bijapuri forces sent against them under Rustam Zaman and Faisal Khan in 1659. In 1660, Adilsha sent his general Sidi Jauhar to attack Shivaji's southern border, in alliance with the Mughals who planned to attack from the north. At that time, Shivaji was encamped at Panhala fort with his forces. Sidi Jauhar's army besieged Panhala in mid-1660, cutting off supply routes to the fort. During the bombardment of Panhala, Sidi Jahuar purchased grenades from the British at Rajapur to increase his efficacy, and also hired some English artillerymen to bombard the fort, conspicuously flying a flag used by the English. This perceived betrayal angered Shivaji, who in December would exact revenge by plundering the English factory at Rajapur and capturing four of the factors, imprisoning them until mid-1663. Accounts vary as to the end of the siege, with some accounts stating that Shivaji escaped from the encircled fort and withdrew to Ragna, following which Adilsha personally came to take charge of the siege, capturing the fort after four months. Other accounts state that after months of siege, Shivaji negotiated with Sidi Jahuar and handed over the fort on the 22nd of September 1660, withdrawing to Vishalgad. Shivaji would later retake Panhala in 1673. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Battle of Pavan Kind. 
There is some dispute over the circumstances of Shivaji's withdrawal treaty or escape and his destination Ragna or Vishalgad, but the popular story details his night movement to Vishalgad and a sacrificial rear guard action to allow him to escape. Per these accounts, Shivaji withdrew from Panhala by cover of night, and as he was pursued by the enemy cavalry, his Maratha Sardar Baji Prabhu Deshpand of Bandal Deshmukh, along with 300 soldiers, volunteered to fight to the death to hold back the enemy at Ghod Kind horse ravine, to give Shivaji and the rest of the army a chance to reach the safety of the Vishalgad fort. In the ensuing battle of Pavan Kind, the smaller Maratha force held back the larger enemy to buy time for Shivaji to escape. Baji Prabhu Deshpand was wounded but continued to fight until he heard the sound of cannon fire from Vishalgad, signaling Shivaji had safely reached the fort, on the evening of 13 July 1660. Ghod Kind, kind meaning, a narrow mountain pass, was later renamed Pavan Kind, sacred pass, in honor of Baji Prabhu Deshpand, Shibasingh Jadav, Fuloji, and all other soldiers who fought in there. Conflict with the Mughals Until 1657, Shivaji maintained peaceful relations with the Mughal Empire. Shivaji offered his assistance to Aurangzeb, the Mughal viceroy of the Deccan and son of the Mughal emperor, in conquering Bijapur in return for formal recognition of his right to the Bijapuri forts and villages under his possession. Dissatisfied with the Mughal response, and receiving a better offer from Bijapur, he launched a raid into the Mughal Deccan. Shivaji's confrontations with the Mughals began in March 1657, when two of Shivaji's officers raided the Mughal territory near Ahmednagar. This was followed by raids in Janur, with Shivaji carrying off 300,000 Hun in cash and 200 horses. Aurangzeb responded to the raids by sending Nasiri Khan, who defeated the forces of Shivaji at Ahmednagar. However, Aurangzeb's countermeasures against Shivaji were interrupted by the rainy season and his battle of succession with his brothers for the Mughal throne following the illness of the Emperor Shah Jahan. <laughs> Attacks on Shasta Khan and Surat Upon the request of Badi Begum of Bijapur, Aurangzeb, now the Mughal emperor, sent his maternal uncle Shasta Khan, with an army numbering over 150,000 along with a powerful artillery division in January 1660 to attack Shivaji in conjunction with Bijapur's army led by Sidi Jauhar. Shasta Khan, with his better equipped and provisioned army of 80,000 seized Pune. He also took the nearby fort of Shakan, besieging it for a month and a half before breaching the walls. Shasta Khan pressed his advantage of having a larger, better provisioned and heavily armed Mughal army and made inroads into some of the Maratha territory, seizing the city of Pune and establishing his residence at Shivaji's palace of Lal Mahal. In April 1663, Shivaji launched a surprise attack on Shasta Khan in Pune. Accounts of the story differ in the popular imagination, but there is some agreement that Shivaji and band of some 200 followers infiltrated Pune, using a wedding procession as cover. They overcame the palace guards, breached the wall, and entered Shasta Khan's quarters, killing those they found there. Shasta Khan escaped, losing his thumb in the melee, but one of his sons and several of his wives were killed. The Khan took refuge with the Mughal forces outside of Pune, and Aurangzeb punished him for this embarrassment with a transfer to Bengal, in retaliation for Shasta Khan's attacks, and to replenish his now depleted treasury. In 1664, Shivaji sacked the port city of Surat, a wealthy Mughal trading center. Treaty of Parandar The attacks on Shasta Khan and Surat enraged Aurangzeb. In response he sent the Rajput Mirza Raja Jai Singh I with an army numbering around 15,000 to defeat Shivaji. Throughout 1665, Jai Singh's forces pressed Shivaji, with their cavalry raising the countryside, and their siege forces investing Shivaji's forts. The Mughal commander succeeded in luring away several of Shivaji's key commanders, and many of his cavalrymen, into Mughal service. By mid-1665, with the fortress at Parandar besieged and near capture, Shivaji was forced to come to terms with Jai Singh. In the Treaty of Parandar, signed between Shivaji and Jai Singh on of June 1665, Shivaji agreed to give up 23 of his forts, keeping 12 for himself, and pay compensation of 400,000 gold hun to the Mughals. 
Shivaji agreed to become a vassal of the Mughal Empire, and to send his son Sambhaji, along with 5,000 horsemen, to fight for the Mughals in the Deccan as a Manzabdar. Arrest in Agra and escape In 1666, Aurangzeb summoned Shivaji to Agra though some sources instead state Delhi, along with his nine-year-old son Sambhaji. Aurangzeb's plan was to send Shivaji to Kandahar, now in Afghanistan, to consolidate the Mughal Empire's northwestern frontier. However, in the court, on 12 May 1666, Aurangzeb made Shivaji stand behind Manzabdars military commanders of his court. Shivaji took offence and stormed out of court, and was promptly placed under house arrest under the watch of Falad Khan, Kotwal of Agra. Shivaji's position under house arrest was perilous, as Aurangzeb's court debated whether to kill him or continue to employ him, and Shivaji used his dwindling funds to bribe courtiers to support his case. Orders came from the emperor to station Shivaji in Kabul, which Shivaji refused. Instead, he asked for his forts to be returned and to serve the Mughals as a Manzabdar. Aurangzeb rebutted that he must surrender his remaining forts before returning to Mughal service. Shivaji managed to escape from Agra, likely by bribing the guards, though the emperor was never able to ascertain how he escaped despite an investigation. Popular legend says that Shivaji smuggled himself and his son out of the house in large baskets, claimed to be sweets to be gifted to religious figures in the city. <laughs> Peace with the Mughals After Shivaji's escape, hostilities with the Mughals ebbed, with Mughal Sardar Jaswant Singh acting as intermediary between Shivaji and Aurangzeb for new peace proposals. During the period between 1666 and 1668, Aurangzeb conferred the title of Raja on Shivaji. Sambhaji was also restored as a Mughal Manzabdar with 5,000 horses. Shivaji at that time sent Sambhaji with General Pratiprao Gujar to serve with the Mughal Viceroy in Aurangabad, Prince Muazzam. Sambhaji was also granted territory in Berar for revenue collection. Aurangzeb also permitted Shivaji to attack the decaying Adil Shahi. The weakened Sultan Ali Adil Shah II sued for peace and granted the rights of Sardeshmukhi and Chathai to Shivaji. Topic: <reconquest>, Reconquest. The peace between Shivaji and the Mughals lasted until 1670. At that time Aurangzeb became suspicious of the close ties between Shivaji and Muazzam, who he thought might usurp his throne, and may even have been receiving bribes from Shivaji. Also at that time, Aurangzeb, occupied in fighting the Afghans, greatly reduced his army in the Deccan. Many of the disbanded soldiers quickly joined Maratha service. The Mughals also took away the Jagger of Barar from Shivaji to recover the money lent to him a few years earlier. In response, Shivaji launched an offensive against the Mughals and recovered a major portion of the territories surrendered to them in a span of four months. Shivaji sacked Surat for second time in 1670. The British and Dutch factories were able to repel his attack, but he managed to sack the city itself, including plundering the goods of a Muslim prince from Mawara un Nar who was returning from Mecca. Angered by the renewed attacks, the Mughals resumed hostilities with the Marathas, sending a force under Dodd Khan to intercept Shivaji on his return home from Surat, but were defeated in the Battle of Vani Dindori near present day Nashik. In October 1670, Shivaji sent his forces to harass the English at Bombay, as they had refused to sell him war materiel. His forces blocked Bombay's woodcutting parties. In September 1671, Shivaji sent an ambassador to Bombay, again seeking materiel, this time for the fight against Danda Rajpuri. The English had misgivings of the advantages Shivaji would gain from this conquest, but also did not want to lose any chance of receiving compensation for his looting their factories at Rajapur. The English sent Lieutenant Stephen Ustik to treat with Shivaji, but negotiations failed over the issue of the Rajapur indemnity. Numerous exchanges of envoys followed over the coming years, with some agreement as to the arms issues in 1674, but Shivaji was never to pay the Rajapur indemnity before his death, and the factory there dissolved at the end of 1682. <laughs> <laughs> Battles of Imrani and Nasari 
In 1674, Pratiprao Gujar, the commander in chief of the Maratha forces, was sent to push back the invading force led by the Bijapuri general, Balal Khan. Pratiprao's forces defeated and captured the opposing general in the battle, after cutting off their water supply by encircling a strategic lake, which prompted Balal Khan to sue for peace. In spite of Shivaji's specific warnings against doing so, Pratiprao released Balal Khan, who started preparing for a fresh invasion. Shivaji sent a displeased letter to Pratiprao, refusing him audience until Balal Khan was recaptured. Upset by his commander's rebuke, Pratiprao found Balal Khan and charged his position with only six other horsemen, leaving his main force behind. Pratiprao was killed in combat, Shivaji was deeply grieved on hearing of Pratiprao's death, and arranged for the marriage of his second son, Rajaram, to Pratiprao's daughter. Anandrao Mohite became Hambareo Mohite, the new Sarnobat commander-in-chief of the Maratha forces. Raigad Fort was newly built by Hiroji and Dulkar as a capital of nascent Maratha kingdom. Coronation. <inaudible> <inaudible> Shivaji had acquired extensive lands and wealth through his campaigns, but lacking a formal title he was still technically a Mughal Zamindar or the son of an Bijapuri Jagardar, with no legal basis to rule his de facto domain. A kingly title could address this and also prevent any challenges by other Maratha leaders, to whom he was technically equal. It would also provide the Hindu Marathas with a fellow Hindu sovereign in a region otherwise ruled by Muslims. Controversy erupted amongst the Brahmins of Shivaji's court. They refused to crown Shivaji as a king because that status was reserved for those of the Kshatriya warrior Varna in Hindu society. Shivaji was descended from a line of headmen of farming villages, and the Brahmins accordingly categorized him as being of the Shudra cultivator Varna. They noted that Shivaji had never had a sacred thread ceremony, and did not wear the thread, which a Kshatriya would. Shivaji summoned Gaga Bhatt, a pandit of Varanasi, who stated that he had found a genealogy proving that Shivaji was descended from the Sisidia Rajputs, and thus indeed a Kshatriya, albeit one in need of the ceremonies befitting his rank. To enforce this status, Shivaji was given a sacred thread ceremony, and remarried his spouses under the Vedic rites expected of a Kshatriya. However, following historical evidence, Shivaji's claim to Rajput, and specifically Sisidia ancestry may be interpreted as being anything from tenuous at best, to inventive in a more extreme reading. Shivaji was crowned king of the Marathas in a lavish ceremony at Raigad on 6 June 1674. In the Hindu calendar it was on the 13th day of the first fortnight of the month of Jayishtha in the year 1596. Gaga Bhatt officiated, holding a gold vessel filled with the seven sacred waters of the rivers Yamuna, Indus, Ganges, Godavari, Narmada, Krishna and Kaveri over Shivaji's head, and chanted the Vedic coronation mantras. After the ablution, Shivaji bowed before Jijabai and touched her feet. Nearly 50,000 people gathered at Raigad for the ceremonies. Shivaji was entitled Shakakarta, founder of an era, and Chhatrapati, paramount sovereign. He also took the title of Haindava Dharmadharak, protector of the Hindu faith. Shivaji's mother Jijabai died on the 18th of June 1674. The Marathas summoned Bengali tantric Goswami Nishal Puri, who declared that the original coronation had been held under inauspicious stars, and a second coronation was needed. This second coronation on 24 September 1674 had a dual use, mollifying those who still believed that Shivaji was not qualified for the Vedic rites of his first coronation, by performing a less contestable additional ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Conquest in southern India Beginning in 1674, the Marathas undertook an aggressive campaign, raiding Khandesh October, capturing Bijapuri Panda April 1675, Karwar and Kolhapur July. In November the Maratha navy skirmished with the Siddhas of Hanhira, but failed to dislodge them. Having recovered from an illness, and taking advantage of a conflict between the Afghans and Bijapur, Shivaji raided Athani in April 1676. In the run up to his expedition, Shivaji appealed to a sense of Dakani patriotism that southern India was a homeland that should be protected from outsiders. His appeal was somewhat successful, and in 1677 Shivaji visited Hyderabad for a month and entered into a treaty with the Kutubsha of the Golconda Sultanate, agreeing to reject his alliance with Bijapur and jointly oppose the Mughals. 
In 1677 Shivaji invaded Karnataka with 30,000 cavalry and 40,000 infantry, backed by Golconda artillery and funding. Proceeding south, Shivaji seized the forts of Velour and Jinji, the latter would later serve as a capital of the Marathas during the reign of his son Rajaram I. Shivaji intended to reconcile with his half-brother Venkoji Ekoji I, Shahaji's son by his second wife, Tukabai nay Mohite, who ruled Thanjavur after Shahaji. The initially promising negotiations were unsuccessful, so whilst returning to Raigad Shivaji defeated his half-brother's army on 26 November 1677 and seized most of his possessions in the Mysore Plateau. Venkoji's wife Dipa Bai, whom Shivaji deeply respected, took up new negotiations with Shivaji, and also convinced her husband to distance himself from Muslim advisers. In the end Shivaji consented to turn over to her and her female descendants many of the properties he had seized, with Venkoji consenting to a number of conditions for the proper administration of the territories and maintenance of Shivaji's future memorial Samadhi. <laughs> Death and succession The question of Shivaji's heir apparent was complicated by the misbehavior of his eldest son, Sambhaji, who was irresponsible. Unable to curb this, Shivaji confined his son to Panhala in 1678, only to have the prince escape with his wife and defect to the Mughals for a year. Sambhaji then returned home, unrepentant, and was again confined to Panhala. In late March 1680, Shivaji fell ill with fever and dysentery, dying around 3 to 5 April 1680 at the age of 52, on the eve of Hanuman Janti. Putalabai, the childless eldest of the surviving wives of Shivaji, committed sati by jumping into his funeral pyre. Another surviving spouse, Sakwarbai, was not allowed to follow suit because she had a young daughter. Rumors followed Shivaji's death, with some Muslims opining he had died of a curse from Jan Muhammad of Jalna, as punishment for Shivaji's troops attacking merchants who had taken refuge in his hermitage. There were also allegations, though doubted by later scholars, that his second wife Soyarabai had poisoned him in order to put her ten-year-old son Rajaram on the throne. After Shivaji's death, Soyarabai made plans with various ministers of the administration to crown her son Rajaram rather than her stepson Sambhaji. On 21 April 1680, ten-year-old Rajaram was installed on the throne. However, Sambhaji took possession of Raigad Fort after killing the commander, and on 18 June acquired control of Raigad, and formally ascended the throne on 20 July. Rajaram, his wife Janki Bai, and mother Soyarabai were imprisoned, and Soyarabai executed on charges of conspiracy that October. The Marathas after Shivaji Shivaji left behind a state always at odds with the Mughals. Soon after his death, in 1681, Aurangzeb launched an offensive in the south to capture territories held by the Marathas, Bijapur and Golconda. He was successful in obliterating the Sultanates but could not subdue the Marathas after spending 27 years in the Deccan. The period saw the capture, torture, and execution of Sambhaji in 1689, and the Marathas offering strong resistance under the leadership of Sambhaji's successor, Rajaram and then Rajaram's widow Tarabai. Territories changed hands repeatedly between the Mughals and the Marathas. The conflict ended in defeat for the Mughals in 1707. Shahu, a grandson of Shivaji and son of Sambhaji, was kept prisoner by Aurangzeb during a 27-year period. After the latter's death, his successor released Shahu. After a brief power struggle over succession with his aunt Tarabai, Shahu ruled the Maratha Empire from 1707 to 1749. Early in his reign, he appointed Balaji Visvanat and later his descendants, as Peshwas prime ministers of the Maratha Empire. The empire expanded greatly under the leadership of Balaji's son, Peshwa Bajirao I and grandson, Peshwa Balaji Bajirao. At its peak, the Maratha Empire stretched from Tamil Nadu in the south, to Peshawar modern-day Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in the north, and Bengal. In 1761, the Maratha army lost the Third Battle of Panipat to Ahmed Shah Abdali of the Afghan Durrani Empire, which halted their imperial expansion in northwestern India. Ten years after Panipat, young Madhavrao Peshwa reinstated Maratha authority over North India. In a bid to effectively manage the large empire, Shahu and the Peshwas gave semi-autonomy to the strongest of the knights, creating the Maratha Confederacy. 
They became known as Gaekwads of Baroda, the Holkars of Indore and Malwa, the Sindhias of Gwalior and Bonsales of Nagpur. In 1775, the British East India Company intervened in a succession struggle in Pune, which became the first Anglo-Maratha War. The Marathas remained the preeminent power in India until their defeat by the British East India Company in the Second and Third Anglo-Maratha Wars 1805 which left the company in control of most of India. Governance <inaudible> 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 Promotion of Marathi and Sanskrit In his court, Shivaji replaced Persian, the common courtly language in the region, with Marathi, and emphasized Hindu political and courtly traditions. The house of Shivaji was well acquainted with Sanskrit and promoted the language. His father Shahaji had supported scholars such as Jairam Pindai, who prepared Shivaji's seal. Shivaji continued this Sanskrit promotion, giving his forts names such as Sindhidurg, Prachangar, and Suvarndurg. He named the Ashta Pradhan Council of Ministers according to Sanskrit nomenclature, with terms such as Nyayadisha, and Senapati, and commissioned the political treatise Rajya Vyavahara Kosha. His Rajparahit, Keshav Pandit, was himself a Sanskrit scholar and poet. He directed projects that sought to replace Indo Persian political norms with Sanskrit based ones. For instance, in 1677 he sponsored a Sanskrit text known as Rajavyavaharakosha lexicon of royal institutes, which provided Sanskrit synonyms for 1500 Indo-Persian administrative terms. <inaudible> <inaudible> Religious policy Shivaji was known for his liberal and tolerant religious policy. While Hindus were relieved to practice their religion freely under a Hindu ruler, Shivaji not only allowed Muslims to practice without harassment, but supported their ministries with endowments, and had many prominent Muslims in his military service. While some accounts of Shivaji state that he was greatly influenced by the Brahmin guru Samarth Ramdas, others have rebutted that Ramdas' role has been over emphasized by later Brahmin commentators to enhance their position. Though many of Shivaji's enemy states were Muslim, he treated Muslims under his rule with tolerance for their religion. Shivaji's sentiments of inclusivity and tolerance of other religions can be seen in an admonishing letter to Aurangzeb, in which he wrote Verily, Islam and Hinduism are terms of contrast. They are used by the true divine painter for blending the colors and filling in the outlines. If it is a mosque, the call to prayer is chanted in remembrance of God. If it is a temple, the bells are rung in yearning for God alone. Noting however that Shivaji had stemmed the spread of the neighboring Muslim states, his contemporary, the poet Kavi Bhushan stated, had not there been Shivaji, Kashi would have lost its culture, Mathura would have been turned into a mosque and all would have been circumcised. There is less evidence of Shivaji's attitude towards the Christians. To one side, in 1667 three Portuguese Catholic priests and a few Christians were killed during Shivaji's raid on Bards. However, during the sack of Surat in 1664, Shivaji was approached by Ambrose, a Capuchin monk who asked him to spare the city's Christians. Shivaji left the mission untouched, saying, The Frankish Padres are good men. Military Shivaji demonstrated great skill in creating his military organization, which lasted until the demise of the Maratha Empire. His strategy rested on leveraging his ground forces, naval forces, and series of forts across his territory. The Maval infantry served as the core of his ground forces reinforced with Talangi musketeers from Karnataka, supported by Maratha cavalry. His artillery was relatively underdeveloped and reliant on European suppliers, further inclining him to a very mobile form of warfare. Forts Forts played a key role in Shivaji's strategy. He captured important forts at Maramdiv Rajgad, Torna, Kandana Sinhagad, and Parandar. He also rebuilt or repaired many forts in advantageous locations. In addition, Shivaji built a number of forts. The number 111 is reported in some accounts, but it is likely the actual number did not exceed 18. 
The historian Jadunath Sarkar assessed that Shivaji owned some 240 to 280 forts at the time of his death. Each was placed under three officers of equal status lest a single trader be bribed or tempted to deliver it to the enemy. The officers acted jointly and provided mutual checks and balance. <laughs> Navy Aware of the need for naval power to maintain control along the Konkan coast, Shivaji began to build his navy in 1657 or 1659, with the purchase of 20 galavats from the Portuguese shipyards of Bassein. Marathi chronicles state that at its height his fleet counted some 400 military ships, though British chronicles counter that the number never exceeded 160 ships. With the Marathas being accustomed to a land based military, Shivaji widened his search for qualified crews for his ships, taking on lower caste Hindus of the coast who were long familiar with naval operations, the famed Malabar pirates, as well as Muslim mercenaries. Noting the power of the Portuguese navy, Shivaji hired a number of Portuguese sailors and Goan Christian converts, and made Rui Lateo Vigas commander of his fleet. Vigas was later to defect back to the Portuguese, taking 300 sailors with him. Shivaji fortified his coastline by seizing coastal forts and refurbishing them, and built his first marine fort at Sindidurg, which was to become the headquarters of the Maratha navy. The navy itself was a coastal navy, focused on travel and combat in the littoral areas, and not intended to go far out to sea. <inaudible> Legacy Shivaji was well known for his strong religious and warrior code of ethics and exemplary character. He was recognized as a great national hero during Indian independence movement. Early depictions Shivaji was admired for his heroic exploits and clever stratagems in the contemporary accounts of English, French, Dutch, Portuguese and Italian writers. Contemporary Englishmen compared him with Alexander, Hannibal and Julius Caesar. President Angier of Bombay gives expression to his views about Shivaji in two dispatches to the directors in London. He being no less dexterous than Alexander the Great was for, by the agility of his winged men, he took in less than eight months what he had delivered to Jaising. And, it is too well known that Shivaji is as second Quintus Sertorius, comes not short of Hannibal for stratagems. Mughal depictions of Shivaji were largely negative, referring to him simply as Shiva, without the honorific G. One Mughal writer in the early 1700s described Shivaji's death as Kafir by Jahannam Raft. The infidel went to hell. Muslim writers of the day generally described him as a plunderer and marauder. Reimagining In the mid-19th century, Maharashtrian social reformer Jyotirao Phule wrote his own interpretation of the Shivaji legend, portraying Shivaji as a hero of the Shudras and Dalits. Phule sought to use the Shivaji mythos to undermine the Brahmins he accused of hijacking the narrative, and uplift the lower classes. His 1869 ballad form story of Shivaji was met with great hostility by the Brahim-dominated media. At the end of the 19th century, Shivaji's memory was leveraged by the non-Brahmin intellectuals of Bombay, who identified as his descendants and through him claimed the Kshatriya Varna. While some Brahmins rebutted this identity, defining them as of the lower Shudra Varna, other Brahmins recognized the Marathas' utility to the Indian independence movement, and endorsed this Kshatriya legacy and the significance of Shivaji. In 1895, Indian nationalist leader, Lokmanya Tilak organized an annual festival to mark the birthday celebrations of Shivaji. Tilak portrayed Shivaji as the opponent of the oppressor, opening loaded implications for the British Raj. Tilak denied any suggestion that his festival was anti-Muslim or disloyal to the government, but simply a celebration of a hero. These celebrations prompted a British commentator in 1906 to note, "...cannot the annals of the Hindu race point to a single hero whom even the tongue of slander will not dare call a chief of dacoits?" One of the early commentators who challenged the negative British view was M. G. Renata, whose Rise of the Maratha Power 1900 declared Shivaji's achievements as the beginning of modern nation-building. Renata criticised earlier British portrayals of Shivaji's state as 
a freebooting power, which thrived by plunder and adventure, and succeeded only because it was the most cunning and adventurous." This is a very common feeling with the readers, who derive their knowledge of these events solely from the works of English historians. In 1919, Sarkar published the seminal Shivaji and His Times, hailed as the most authoritative biography of the king since James Grant Duff's 1826 A History of the Marathas. A respected scholar, Sarkar was able to read primary sources in Persian, Marathi, and Arabic, but was challenged for his criticism of the chauvinism of Marathi historians' views of Shivaji. Likewise, though supporters cheered his depiction of the killing of Afzal Khan as justified, they decried Sarkar's terming as murder, the killing of the Hindu Raja Chandrao Moor and his clan. <laughs> Inspiration As political tensions rose in India in the early 20th century, some Indian leaders came to rework their earlier stances on Shivaji's role. Jawaharlal Nehru had in 1934 noted, "...some of the Shivaji's deeds, like the treacherous killing of the Bijapur general, lower him greatly in our estimation." Following public outcry from Pune intellectuals, Congress leader T. R. Diojorikar noted that Nehru had admitted he was wrong regarding Shivaji, and now endorsed Shivaji as great nationalist. In 1966, the Shiv Sena Army of Shivaji party formed to promote the interests of Maharashtrians in the face of migration to the region from other parts of India, and the accompanying loss of power for locals. His image adorns literature, propaganda, and icons of the Maratha centric party. In modern times, Shivaji is considered as a national hero in India, especially in the state of Maharashtra, where he remains arguably the greatest figure in the state's history. Stories of his life form an integral part of the upbringing and identity of the Marathi people. Further, he is also recognized as a warrior legend, who sowed the seeds of Indian independence. Shivaji is upheld as an example by the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, and also of the Maratha caste-dominated Congress parties in Maharashtra, such as the Indira Congress and the Nationalist Congress Party. Past Congress party leaders in the state such as Yashwantrao Chavan were considered political descendants of Shivaji. In the late 20th century, Babasaheb Parandar became one of the most significant artists in portraying Shivaji in his writings, leading him to be declared in 1964 as the Shiv Shahir, Bard of Shivaji. However, Parandar, a Brahmin, was also accused of overemphasizing the influence of Brahmin gurus on Shivaji, and his Maharashtra Bhushan award ceremony in 2015 was protested by those claiming he had defamed Shivaji. Parandar has, on the other end, been accused of a communalist and anti-Muslim portrayal of Shivaji at odds with the king's own actions. Topic: Controversy. In 1993, the Illustrated Weekly published an article suggesting that Shivaji was not opposed to Muslims per se, and was influenced by their form of governance. Congress party members called for legal actions against the publisher and writer, Maharathi newspapers accused them of imperial prejudice, and Shiv Sena called for the writer's public flogging. Maharashtra brought legal action against the publisher under regulations prohibiting enmity between religious and cultural groups, but a high court found the Illustrated Weekly had operated within the bounds of freedom of expression. In 2003, American academic James W. Lane published his book Shivaji, Hindu King in Islamic India, which was followed by heavy criticism, including threats of arrest. As a result of this publication, the Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute in Pune where Lane had researched was attacked by a group of Maratha activists calling itself the Sambhaji Brigade. The book was banned in Maharashtra in January 2004, but the ban was lifted by the Bombay High Court in 2007, and in July 2010 the Supreme Court of India upheld the lifting of ban. This lifting was followed by public demonstrations against the author and the decision of the Supreme Court. Topic. Commemorations Commemorations of Shivaji are found throughout India, most notably in Maharashtra. Shivaji's statues and monuments are found almost in every town and city in Maharashtra as well as in different places across India. Other commemorations include the Indian Navy's ship the Inns Shivaji, numerous postage stamps, and the main airport and railway headquarters in Mumbai. 
In Maharashtra, there has been a long tradition of children building a replica fort with toy soldiers and other figures during the festival of Diwali in memory of Shivaji. A proposal to build a giant memorial called Shiv Smarak was approved in 2016 to be located near Mumbai on a small island in the Arabian Sea. It will be 210 meters tall, making it the world's largest statue when completed in possibly 2021. Equals <laughs> equals notes. <laughs>